Good evening. Welcome to worship at beautiful Savior's here in Somerville in Long's Corner, South Carolina. Uh, our online worship this evening has a worship guide that goes along with it if you'd like to follow along. It's available for you at ourbeautifulsavior.com. You can get to it by following the, the directions for online services. Um, you can download it as a PDF and look at it on your device or, or print it out there too. We continue with our midweek themes this evening with questions of Lent. This evening focusing on a question that Jesus asked to the, the women on the way to the cross. If people do this when the tree is green, what well, will they do when the tree is dry? It's the, the focus for this evening's services. And it's laid out for you in the worship folder beginning on page three. Come on, let us worship the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. From the rising of the sun to its setting, in the name of the Lord is to be praised. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. O Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive us all our sins. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. From the rising of the sun to its setting, in the name of the Lord, peace be with Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our companion on the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope, that we may know you as you are revealed in Scripture. Grant this for the sake of your love. Amen. Passion reading for this evening comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, beginning with verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women, who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves, for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? This is the Gospel of our Lord. We join together to sing our hymn of the day as it's printed in your worship.
For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Cry for you because there is a time coming, Jesus says. There is a season on the horizon, the likes of which you have never experienced, a day the likes of which you have never known. Now we know that children are a tremendous gift from the Lord. And we know that still today. If it's possible, they were even more valuable than in Jesus' day. People value the gift of children. We have numerous examples in the pages of Scripture of, of, of childless uh, couples who long to have a child, who beg to their God, plead with God to give them the gift of a child. And the, the birth of a child is a tremendously wonderful and joyful occasion. If any of you have children in your lives, uh, you know that, that ever since they entered your lives, your lives have never been the same. And you can never imagine your life without those children. You'd never want to have a life without them. Children are an incredible blessing. But a time is coming. Jesus says, a time is coming when just the opposite will be true. Blessed are the childless women. What Jesus is saying here, my friends, is striking. But it's even worse. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Quoting the prophet Hosea, who is part of his calling was to announce to Israel uh, the destruction that was coming to the nation at the hands of the Assyrians. Jesus says a time like that is coming. A, a time like the time of Hosea is coming. When, when, when people fled to the hills, when, when, when they, they said, I don't want to face this suffering. This suffering is so bad that I would rather die. Put me out of my misery. Bury me. Oh, what kind of situation is so bad that the better thing is that your children never would have been born? What kind of situation is so incredibly terrible that the better thing is just to die already? It's at that point when Jesus asks the question. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen? when it is dry. If you were looking to have a get-together, um, at this time a group of three or less, of course, and as part of that get-together, you were planning on having a bonfire, what kind of wood would you use to start your fire? Would you pull up the chainsaw and fell a big, healthy tree? Would you, would you break off some, some live branches or some green shoots and, and, and try to use that wood to start your fire? Or would the wood of a tree that was already dead and dry be a better choice? I think we all understand what kind of wood is fit for the fire. And so that means we all understand the, the, the earthly components of, of Jesus' uh, little proverbial question here. And so we can really focus our attention on, on answering this. Uh, who are the people doing these things that Jesus talks about? And, and, and who is the green and dry tree? Or what is the time of the green and dry tree? And, and Bible commentators have, have spent some time discussing this little proverb and what Jesus means by it. And, and generally have come up with three very similar interpretations that really get you to a, a similar meaning and a, and a similar application. What does Jesus mean when he says this? Uh, does he mean if, if the Romans treat Jesus this way, whom they've declared not guilty, what will they do with somebody who actually is guilty? Like the rebellious occupants of Jerusalem and Judea. Or, or maybe if the Jews treat the promised Messiah, the Jewish leaders treat the promised Messiah this way, how will they be treated for putting to death their Savior? Or ultimately, if, if God is the one in control of all this, if, if God allows his sinless son to be treated in this vicious manner, then how will he let people who have their own guilt and sin still clinging to them be treated. 
Because Jesus says a, a time is coming. In fact, just as in the day of Hosea, the, the prophet, the people had that expectation of, of suffering at the hands of the Assyrians, the people of Jesus' day needed to have the expectation of suffering even more greatly at the hands of the Romans. In 70 AD, just about 40 years after Jesus had spoken these words, the daughters of Jerusalem would be crying out. Those women of Jerusalem would be saying, it would be better if we never had children at all rather than sitting here and watching our own children starve to death or die at the hands of the brutal Romans. They would run up to the hills and say, we wish these mountains would, would fall on us, that we would die instead of face the wrath of Rome. And yet there's something even more terrible and even more awful than the loss of home and family and, and even life itself that comes into view here. Because after all, why did the Israelites at the time of Hosea suffer at the hands of the Assyrians? Because of their sin. Because of their ultimate rejection of the only God who saves. Why were the people of Jerusalem and Judea in, in Jesus' day about to suffer at the hands of the Romans? It was because of their sin. Their ultimate rejection of him as their Savior. And you see, these times of, of judgment really point forward to another time. These same prophecies about, about judgment are, are quoted in, in Revelation chapter 6 in a, a, a passage that talks about another judgment, a, a final judgment day. Listen. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, crawl on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand? Why will sinners look at the last day with such fear and such dread. Because without a Savior, fear and dread are the only things that last day will bring to sinners. And that, Jesus says, that is the only thing to cry about as we see him walking the way of sorrow. Don't cry for me. He says, don't, don't cry because I'm going to the cross. Cry because of what's sending me to the cross. Sin. The world's sin. Your sin. And mine. Isn't that what we just got done singing about in the hymn for the day? Saying these words. Tis I who should be smitten, my doom should here be written, bound hand and foot in hell. The fetters and the scourging, the floods around you surging, tis I who have deserved them well. A crown of thorns you're wearing, my shame and scorn you're bearing, that I might ransom thee. My bondsman ever willing, my place with patience filling, from sin and guilt has made me free. My friends, don't you see? It's like he so often does. Jesus turns everything upside down and inside out because he, he takes this way of the cross and he makes it for you, for me, not a way of sorrow, but a way of joy, a way of our redemption, a way of forgiveness, the way that we're set free from sin and guilt, all because the green tree was thrown into the fire for you. Because Jesus was thrown into the fire for you, in your place. And that means when you look at the scene, when you see Jesus walking the way of sorrow, you can go ahead and cry, but not for him. 
And not for you, not anymore. Because Jesus walked to the cross has paid your ransom. He set you free from guilt and sin forever. Instead, he says, cry for those who still reject him as the only way of salvation. Because the day, the last day, the day of judgment, is a day of dread and fear for people like that. Cry for them. But don't just cry for them. Tell them about the green tree. Tell them about this world's perfect Savior. Tell them that Jesus already faced the fire to set them free. You know, at a time when many people think that a virus is going to bring this world to an end, it's good for us to remember that there is only one thing that will bring this world to the end. It's the day that Jesus comes to judge. And while you can take all sorts of measures to keep yourself safe from a virus that spreads over the whole world, there's no social distancing, there's no sheltering in place, there's no miracle vaccine that will protect you from what happens on that day, on the last day, when Jesus comes to judge. Because on that day, even those who condemn him, the princes and kings of this world that we talked about in Revelation, even those are going to have to stand under Jesus' judgment, and everyone else who rejected him, too. And that's sad. But we have hope. And at a time like this, when people are thinking about the end of life and the end of the world, it's our calling to hold that ultimate hope out to the world. To remind the world that they do have a Savior. Because the time of the tree, green, the green tree is, is going on right now in another sense, too. Because today is still the day of God's favor. It's still the day of his salvation. It is still a time of grace. Because as long as we have life and breath, we have the opportunity to hear about Jesus and to put our faith in him, our hope in him. As long as we have life and breath, we have the opportunity to tell others about their Savior. To, to tell others about the only Savior there is. That they too in him might become green. That they too in him might have life. And isn't that exactly what Jesus was doing on his way to the cross? He wasn't thinking about himself. He was preaching one last sermon. He was giving one last warning. He was giving one last plea for those people to repent and to put their hope in him. And as we walk the way of sorrow, that's what we'll do too. You know, in a sense, our entire life is a via dolorosa. We're all pilgrims on a way of sorrow. It's just that sometimes we're more aware of that than others. But as we walk this, this way of sorrow, when we remember the reason for really being sad is our sin and its consequences, and we recognize that we have a savior from those sins and their consequences, my friends, that changes absolutely everything. It gives us hope in the midst of sorrow. It even gives us life in the midst of death. Just like Jesus walked his way of sorrow, we who follow him will walk our own way of sorrow, but we don't do it alone because Jesus goes with us every single step. Of the way. And just like at the end of his way to the cross, Jesus received a crown, so too we, after bearing a cross in this life, will one day wear a crown forever for Jesus' sake. And Lord willing, so will also many with whom we share our faith too. God bless. At this time, we gather our thank offering for the Lord. You can do that by visiting ourbeautifulsavior.com slash give. 
If you're watching on our website right now, at the bottom of the page you're watching on, there's some detailed information for giving your offering. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a link in the description.
once again to all those worshiping with us this evening. We're glad you could join us. Uh, we hope you can join us again soon on Sunday as we continue our Lenten worship series on Sundays, the, the Jesus Feed. God bless you this night and the rest of the week, and we'll see you soon.